So welcome everyone to Opera Beyond Jam Session webinar hosted by us, the Finnish National Opera and Ballet. Today is the third edition of our Opera Beyond Jam Sessions and we will focus on the XR enhanced next generation digital workflows for performing arts. How can the immersive technologies lead us towards a more flexible, ecological and cost efficient design workflows and collaborative processes? These are some of the questions we are looking into today. We all have taken a tremendous digital leap during the pandemic and we feel that it would be great if we could turn this collective tragedy in cultural sector into a positive learning experience. This is a challenge that we want to take on. For those who are here for the first time, I use the opportunity to present our Opera Beyond project with a few words. Opera Beyond project is a multi-year project by us, the FNOB, and we want to, through this project, we want to enrich the existing canon, the operatic and ballet canon, uh, to explore the creative friction between a very uh, uh, two very classical art forms and the uh, fast evolving uh, technological uh, scene. Oh. And we are searching for novel ways uh, of doing things, novel way of expressing things, novel ways of reaching to new audiences. And as here in the jam sessions, we want to create an ecosystem for co-learning where we can share experiences and uh, become aware what's happening elsewhere and learn from each other. And of course, the most important thing is that we expose ourselves to new ideas. Then a few words about um, uh, today's schedule. Uh, after me, we will hear a keynote by Joris Weidum, who comes from the University of Arts at Utrecht. After that, uh, a team from the Finnish National Opera, Hannu, Timo and Kalle, will present the XR stage design platform. And after these, each session we have Q&A. Uh, where you can do some um, questions to the to the speakers, and after that, uh, after both um, sessions, we will have an online speakers corner where we will have open discussion, and you are welcome to share your ideas. That is today's program. So now I would like to present to you our visiting keynote speaker for today. Joris Weidum is a researcher and designer of mixed reality experiences, focusing on interdisciplinary creative processes and performativity. He is a lecturer at the University of Arts of Utrecht, where he founded in 2012 the Media and Performance Laboratory Map Lab enabling practice-led artistic research on the intersection of performance, media and technology. And as part of Joris' uh, PhD project, he researches creative processes in collaborative mixed reality in environments. So this is really a topic that is very interesting for all of us. And today his presentation is titled Embodied Design in Real-Time Collaborative Mixed Reality Environments for Theatre and Performance. The floor is yours, Joris. Thank you, uh, Lillian Anastina, for uh, inviting me. And uh, let me try to share my screen for a moment. All right. Oh, sorry, I have to cancel this for a moment because I forgot to share my sound as well. And everyone outside, just one reminder, close your microphones for any external disturbances. Thank you. Again, thank you so much for uh, for inviting me. I'm very excited to be in this particular 
uh, group of peers uh, because I feel all the questions that have been raised by the uh, Opera Beyond program is very relevant to my work, but I think it's also, uh, as Lee was saying, very relevant that, uh, for the times that we live in. Um, so uh, I will start uh, uh, with my uh, um, presentation, uh, indeed, uh, uh, about embodied design in real-time collaborative mixed reality environments for theatre and performances. Um, I've been already kindly introduced, so I don't have to introduce myself, which is really nice. But I think it's nice to mention that I always call myself a mixed reality designer uh, for the simple reason that nobody agrees what that really means. And that affords me a lot of space actually to move in between disciplines and fields and really still explore and develop what mixed reality design and experiences can really be. Another thing which is maybe nice to mention is that I call myself a technical dramaturg. So I work a lot with uh, uh, professional uh, mixed reality designers, but also people from performing arts and theater uh, to create professional mixed reality design projects. Uh, but I also teach and I'm also a student, which is really nice because I'm sort of learning new languages and concepts to um, uh, articulate and explain a bit what it is that I feel is important in mixed reality design. Now, mixed reality is something else, maybe as XR. Uh, it, it can also be a bit of a hmm, uh, talking about definition kind of discussion. So uh, I'd like to just use a Wikipedia version where we basically have uh, Paul Milgram's model that we know already from the 90s, uh, saying that uh, mixed reality is the merging of real and virtual worlds to produce new environments where physical and digital objects coexist and interact in real time. So mixed reality is not a term for a device, neither is virtual reality or augmented reality. It's rather I see it as a scale of experience somewhere between the real and the virtual, which also means if you design mixed reality experiences, you can actually move back and forth on this experiential scale. <laughs> So this is a project I did for the Prague Quadrennial uh, already two years ago. Um, it's uh, called 36Q Blue Hour VR. Uh, it's a site-specific performative mixed reality installation. Um, I will not get into this project too much, but I thought it's maybe nice to give an impression on the work that I do as a designer myself. Uh, why it is relevant, I think, for this particular lecture and, uh, and session is that it really combines a physical location and a virtual space and overlaps those two into uh, an experience where the body is actually central and the virtual and physical space start to mix and merge and uh, give a, a, a particular uh, uh, experience. So in the design of mixed reality experiences, it's not only that you design a virtual space, but you need to also think about the physical uh, space as well as part of the design. Um, now, of course, uh, uh, the, we're, we're now more talking about dance and opera. So I uh, uh, looked at my own portfolio and I was involved in, a, in an opera project um, that uh, uh, was using opera principles, uh, but in a new way. So I just very briefly want to show you an impression. I was uh, here not a designer, I was just a, a researcher of this project and also a bit of an advisor on certain aspects of the design. And the reason why I want to show you this is that um, this was an experiment done already in 2017 uh, by uh, the, the Dutch, uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's a double Dutch, but Travel Opera, it's called. They uh, do performances uh, on different locations. And um, I think why this project is interesting is that we had half of the audience actually participate uh, in the opera itself by wearing VR masks. And within VR, they were encouraged to actually sing and make noises. And these uh, uh, noises they would make would actually be visible within the VR headsets. Uh, so they would get feedback. And because all the helmets were synchronized, they actually formed a choir. Uh, and then meanwhile, while they're all in their little uh, VR bubble, they actually started to sing as a choir for the other half of the audience. They were just actually looking at 
uh, those people with the VR helmets. And in between those people were actually the actual real professional opera singers doing the wonderful arias uh, in between. So we really played with this idea of audiences participating and also people watching each other becoming performers. Another thing is that we won an, uh, a prize with this particular uh, <laughs> piece. And funny enough, it's not a prize for performing arts, but actually a prize for best cross media game. Uh, and I think it's funny because it sort of explains how we are still all a bit confused by now uh, in this wonderful hybrid domain of using performing arts, game technologies, media, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I think it's sort of nice uh, to uh, mention that often um, uh, experiences are explained in, 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 in lectures and in, in symposia as some sort of end result product, but rarely people talk about the actual design process itself. Um, so uh, this uh, uh, opera Weltatem is, is also partly explained in a, in a publication that I did uh, for the IETM, which you can download for free. Uh, but this is also uh, maybe very good for this lecture and I was asked also to emphasize more and think about and uh, reflect a bit on the design process itself using mixed reality technologies. So um, let's start maybe with something that is very obvious to you, um, which is that there's different kinds of VR um, that you can use for designing mixed reality experiences. And um, I think the most important difference that we should actually make is uh, somewhere uh, between using 360 video and using real time 3D graphics. Um, there's a big difference there because actually uh, 360 video is like film and video pre recorded, while real time uh, 3D graphics are actually uh, live. Uh, they're actually uh, uh, they can be used and adapted uh, uh, in real time. And that means that real time 3D graphics actually are very similar to theater and performance itself. It really affords all sorts of live improvisation and live interactions by audience members. So probably you already know a lot of it, uh, examples of uh, uh, 360 uh, 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 recordings of live performances and uh, the National Ballet in the Netherlands already did one in 2016. Um, what I think is interesting is that the choreographer had to sort of rethink his choreography because the camera of course is in the smack middle of the stage. So instead of having a frontal view, uh, he had to rethink his whole choreography from the fact that actually the camera is standing in the middle and the dancers had to sort of dance around it. Um, but on top of that, if you see this 360 movie, um, at least in my opinion, it, it doesn't do justice at all to ballet or, or dance because of course they're just pixels. They're pre-recorded pixels that you see so you don't feel the presence of the dancers at all. Uh, you don't hear them breathe, you don't feel, you don't see them sweat. Um, so uh, there, there's really something lacking when something is pre-recorded because you're there uh, but you're not really there. Uh, you're there in a, in, in a recording, in a memory almost of something that happened before. Um, so, uh, Yari, just one um, little thing. If you could share your screen again, because I think someone like sorry stole <laughs> stole the share screen. So oh, if you can put it back. Really? How did that happen? Uh, it, maybe it was an accident. But if you could please do that again. That oh, would be great. so. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Yes. I'm not sure how many slides you now missed then, actually. Did you see this one? Um, I don't think so. Oh, but we you heard see... you all this time. And did you see this one? <laughs> I think we missed you after the, uh, the, I mean, the opera. OK, OK. Well, anyway, so you understand the difference between 360 video and um, and real time 3D. This is the, the, the National Ballet um, uh, being recorded in 360. Um, and then what if, and that would be my question. What then if you would use real time 3D technology? So this is, for example, a nice example of uh, La Perry, uh, which actually is a performance uh, within a almost like a game um, that you can later play in your own time by wearing a VR helmet. 
Um, and uh, the dancers in this case were motion captured. So the capturing here is not a capturing of pixels, but it's really a capturing of the, I would almost say like the, the biomechanical movements of the dancer. However, if you play this game or if you witness this performance inside of VR, the dancer is, of course, not aware of your presence. So while we were both in the same space and there was a, like a really a spatial connotation to being with the dancer, I really noticed that she was not responding at all to me because, of course, again, she was pre-recorded. So um, just to reflect a little bit on this. Undoubtedly, you, uh, most of you have seen Lord of the Rings. Um, don't get me wrong here. Uh, I know it's just uh, an entertainment film, but there's something interesting about this uh, production. Already, already in 2001, uh, Veta Digital uh, actually invented um, and, and fine-tuned all sorts of workflows that did something very fundamental, a fundamental shift in making film. Uh, my background is also in animation, and often you do the, the production of the special effects after uh, the, the shots of the films and everything in post-production. That's where you put all the layers together. Then everything, all the materials are already shot. Uh, you cannot change anything about the story anymore. Yet really, at the final stage, you put all the images together. Now, something interesting happened here in this particular film is that they motion captured with very uh, early technologies, as you can see, they motion captured uh, all the performances of the, in this case, the cave troll, um, and then uh, put all those uh, materials together in a pre-production shoot. So what they basically did is they took all the uh, mocap material and gave that to Peter Jackson, the director, um, in a very early stage uh, 3D engine that we know from games. And that in actually enabled him to have a motion captured camera and do a live shoot of the whole action scene with all the different monsters and, and, and players involved. So I find it very interesting because here something like film suddenly becomes almost like a documentary shoot, like you're shooting something that is happening live. In this case, it's not happening live, it's, it's, it's a, a recording being played. But the filmer uh, and the director can still change camera angles, uh, speed of the scene, etc. So uh, film being known as a very linear process, especially with special effects, by the use of motion capture and real-time 3D technology, some, some, uh, somehow became life and something that they could actually change in the moment uh, during the recordings. Now, uh, some of my own work uh, in relation to live performance is, for example, uh, with the work of Cop Squad, uh, a Berlin and British-based uh, 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 arts collective that really work from, in, um, from improvisation, a very devised way of making performances. Um, and they already used a lot like film, like uh, live video and um uh, 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 pre-recorded videos, but also live streams, etc., within her performances, uh, their performances. So they were quite used in using media, but they were not used in using uh, VR. Uh, sorry. Oh. Um, so uh, um, what I uh, offered them was actually a, a few sessions where they could actually improvise with mixed reality technologies to devise a new performance themselves. And we really used a lot of different setups. So first we explore some uh, VR tools and some VR uh, experiences just to get inspired. But then I really had them in a lab uh, space just doing a lot of different configurations. And the nice thing about these configurations is that they were really capable of exploring through improvisation certain scenes. And uh, just to give a quick idea of the setup, what you see here is the, the, the two performers being in VR uh, in a live studio. Uh, so they were, we, they're, they're an arts collective, so they were also being watched by others. 
they would have uh, some some uh, some some roles or some lines or some ideas about the particular scene, and everybody else was also uh, watching. And then um, we introduced objects uh, that were tracked in the space. It's a bit hard to see, but you see this little circle around uh, a chair there in the back. And you see, also see on the screen, maybe in between the people on the projection screen in the back, you also see a chair. So there was a, a physical object also in the virtual space. And then on top of that, we had a camera because uh, they were, of course, not used to using all sorts of complex uh, controllers and, and joysticks and stuff to, to, to do live operation of, of the virtual space. So I offered them also a physical camera that we also tracked in space that could do mixed reality images, uh, but also um, uh, 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 full virtual. So the camera could be physically moved through the space and that would actually be visible then on the projection in the back wall. And most importantly, I, I keep getting messages, by the way, that people are waiting in the lobby. So I hope that somebody is allowing them. Uh, I, I am, I am uh, accepting right. okay. every okay. request. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so, and then finally, and this is, uh, uh, I think, quite important. I also built controls. Um, for the performers um, um, uh, and, and theater makers to actually change aspects of the virtual space. So here you see one of the Gob Squad members uh, to the left sitting with a, a MIDI controller where she could actually change to different scenes, virtual scenes in, uh, in real time. She could fake, fade the background, she could play with uh, the lights. Uh, both physical and virtual. Uh, she could play with uh, the, the sun going up or down, so you would uh, have daylight or night uh, scenes. But also she could, could change the physical chair in virtual reality into different objects. So it could also become a car uh, or some other uh, weird objects. So they would have a physical chair actually transforming into different things. And especially with the car, it was quite interesting to see people sitting on stage on a, a normal chair. And then on the screen, you could see them literally sitting also in, in a different kind of vehicle. And on, on top of that, you also had some videos that you could play in that space. Um, so this is a, a setup of what I call a collaborative mixed reality environment that affords device theater, live improvisation and making changes while you're still, you know, on stage together doing this, uh, these design collaborations. But then, of course, uh, Corona hit and it became very hard to physically be together in one space. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, with Gob Squad, it happened just in the middle of the project that I did with them. So in the second half, we actually shifted to using that virtual space online as a collaborative improvisation studio. So um, everybody would be in their own house uh, uh, logging in with VR and then uh, using a, a virtual improvisation studio, using the same assets they already did some preliminary work with, uh, jumping into different avatars. And in this case, I made the controls also virtual. So they could still control uh, how things would behave in the virtual world by just pressing a button or, or moving a slider. And next to that, I created what I call the object spawn table, which was basically like a table with props that they could browse through. And if they would hit the object, it would spawn in the space and they could actually do improvisational sessions with that as well. Now, this afforded uh, them actually to do a lot of rehearsals and, and improvisational rehearsal, devising their performance uh, uh, in the few weeks that, that there was really like serious lockdowns going on. And, and some of those materials have actually ended up also on stage uh, in uh, their, their current uh, uh, um, uh, theater show called 1984 Back to No Future. Um, and interestingly, I was really pushing for doing the VR improvisations live on stage, but the theater technician had so many things that he needed to do in building up the, the space itself with projections and cameras and all sorts of stuff, audio of course, that he felt that having also then uh, VR rigs, uh, motion capture, uh, et cetera, to, to be set up in the maybe sometimes four to six hours they have to put things up was a bit too much. So they ended up in the end doing the virtual reality scenes uh, 
uh, and, and recorded them uh, uh, already a day before and then showcasing them uh, within the live performance uh, as a pre-recorded session, which to me was a bit of a loss of the real timeness. However, I think it's very interesting that they uh, really managed to use uh, the virtual space uh, to generate material and then reincorporate that also in their final stage design. Um, so having said all that, um, this is just a little bit of, about the work that I've done, but of course I'm not the only one doing these experiments. And I was very impressed, of course, uh, with the Royal Shakespeare project, like these high-end projects doing similar things, but with much more budget and, and, and uh, very good equipment and very professional, uh, 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 high standard people, of course. But not everybody has that amount of, of budget or resources available, um, which doesn't mean that you cannot do these experiences uh, or experiments yourself. I think one of the... You are now inside the Chekhov OS. I think a very nice example uh, during Corona times is, uh, for example, Arlequin Players um, uh, that actually developed almost almost in their living room, uh, but in their studio, a green screen studio, and they started to work with a game designer who just uh, added uh, um, uh, nice scenes in a, in an, a 3D engine, and they basically juxtapose um, or, or put on planes uh, uh, the, the, the video performances uh, of the actors in a virtual stage. Some of these are pre-recorded, some of these are live, I think what is very important, if you look at the third photo to the bottom, you see a live performer talking also to audience members being online present with Zoom. And I think it's very nice that those audience members were also shown within that virtual stage they were also looking at. So you notice also that, of course, the moment you start to use these virtual spaces where people can join, um, you also can think about how those people can actually be engaged by maybe having a saying in what will happen uh, or maybe giving comments uh, in the chat, which actually people were doing this piece as well. Now, uh, going back to opera, the same technique you could also use uh, with opera. So. Of course, um, you can have very high-end avatars with super mocap, uh, but you could also indeed just use a, a green screen and have a live performer being streamed inside of a virtual space that can be shared by many uh, by being in VR or maybe streaming this whole thing online. Uh, so this is, I think, also what, what Sarah Ellis of Royal Shakespeare Company was saying, is this, this multi-channel approach to make sure it's accessible to a lot of people is, of course, something we need to figure out more and more, uh, not only due to Corona, but indeed because of many reasons. Um, so I think it's really nice to see that that these experiments are really progressing. And here you see several scenes, uh, uh, different opera singers streaming from their, their studio uh, in a virtual space. And the reason why the camera work is so freaky is it's, it's just a first person view that you now see. So it's, just, it's a recording of somebody wearing a VR headset at home, being present with other people. And uh, I can jump to the end. Quickly, you now see also little avatars uh, coming on stage and now the performer has glasses on as well. So she can also see them uh, just thanking everybody uh, for this particular performance. So it's a nice, interesting clash and hybrid clash, both of aesthetics and cultures and disciplines uh, <laughs> happening in these uh, interesting experiences and experiments, I would say. Um, now, I think beyond the point of using avatars and maybe putting uh, 2D green screen people uh, on a flat plane, we also now have, of course, volumetric video, which I think is very interesting development. Um, some of them, for example, there's now a company in Eindhoven as well, uh, are capable of doing this also with streaming. And that means you can actually stream live video performances of people in 3D, and they're also really like streamed as 3D uh, uh, characters, meaning that people can uh, have a VR helmet on and walk around them, uh, but they can also like they're showing in this trailer of Microsoft, they can also use flat screens, uh, but still move around basically in a virtual space. So I think this is a very interesting and also undoubtedly more and more accessible technology that we might want to look into a bit more.
And I think more and more uh, designers and, and uh, performance uh, uh, artists are discovering these virtual spaces uh, for their performative quality. So what you see here is um, uh, a dance performance uh, that was shown, um, La Comédie Virtuelle. Uh, you also log in in a virtual theater, so you actually have first uh, other avatars waiting to get in. And here you see, um, actually, I think it was five, five, four or five dancers actually being live streamed from three different physical locations doing a dance performance. And those little sticks that you see are live audience members from all over the world that sort of join this particular moment in time. So all of this is live, but of course it's completely co-located. Both audiences and performers are, were actually all over the world. So in time it was synchronized, but in place it was completely different. And what is of course very interesting is that when you do a dance performance uh, in a virtual space, you can really play also with the bodies, with the environment. Uh, so they really flirted a lot with uh, a virtual theater transforming slowly into a more and more surreal environment. Um, however, in this particular performance, while you could actually move around, even in between the dancers, the dancers would completely ignore your presence. They could see it on the screen in their studio, but they would not change their dance behavior on the basis of your presence or position. And this to me felt a bit awkward because you are in a real time environment. Um, uh, so why, you know, it felt a bit weird that I, I am there, but I'm not really acknowledged. Um, and that is something that, that I find interesting to explore a bit more also within the performing arts, which is how to have, if you are there in real time, how to, how to also be engaged and acknowledged in the performance itself. Uh, I think Improvive, for example, are doing very interesting uh, experiences right now. Uh, they have live dancers in the studio. Also, this is streamed online in a, a shared virtual space. People can then actually join in. Uh, but at some point, um, uh, the dancers are actually in the virtual space. Uh, they're, they're having a black avatar. Um, but the audience is actually in white. So you see here that the dancers and the audience are much more mingled. And they, are, they can really interact. Also, the dancers really invite you to sort of move with you. Uh, as you can see, the bodies have been completely changed into almost like snake-like uh, uh, creatures and you could use your controllers uh, in a different way by actually the controllers would also uh, transform and twist your your own snake-like body and with the dancers you could really have very sensuous and very intim intimate relationships uh, uh, discovering movement discovering nearness uh, um, and I thought that this was a very mesmerizing and very exciting performance where clearly you're not an audience, you're not even a spectator, but you become a participant. But you also shift back. So sometimes people would just step out basically in VR, st stand on the sideline and would just witness. So you could also alternate between pr participation and spectatorship, which is of course uh, really nice. Now, this idea of co-performing is really taking off. So what do you say? Are you ready to do something? Uh, this is the award-winning Pandora X uh, performance uh, showcased uh, also in the Venice Biennale uh, a year ago. And here we have again live actors performing from their own living room in a virtual space that is then uh, uh, populated and uh, by all sorts of audience members that log in in the right moment. And here the audience was actually part of the Greek Choir. So they also had a role. So you're partly moving from one scene to the other. You have to follow some of the actors and sometimes you also have to perform as part of the overall experience. And um, at, while it was still quite a classical theater piece, so it, it's not like a game. It's not like you can win something or have to do tasks right or wrong. It's really about becoming a co-performer. Um, and I, th I think these experiments will actually 
uh, 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 get more and more. I mean, we, we know this already. This is not new in the sense we, we did this already in Second Life or, or even earlier online worlds. But you really see this now taking off in a more and more immersive and high fidelity way. Um, and then uh, to, to maybe uh, move a bit towards the end of this presentation, um, I'd like to also point out that, of course, new students, uh, theater and performance students, amongst uh, uh, art academies uh, where I teach, for example, um, are actually playing with My these tools a, boy lives only a lot. Um, so uh, we have now students from theater, media, games and interaction, uh, the conservatoire, dance, working together, creating all sorts of interesting mixed reality experiences uh, for audience members in physical spaces, in online spaces, in hybrid spaces. And I think on top of that, what is interesting is that they're using the tools also to design. So it's not just um, a tool to make the final presentation in, but they use the tools also to come together, to do sketches, to do prototypes. And here you see a performance that they made last year uh, where people would be in a physical studio present in a, a, a live performance, while online in an online social VR platform, audience members would also uh, uh, be invited to to share the experience and actually become in a way stand-ins in certain parts of the scenes. Some of the objects here were trackable and could be triggering all sorts of memories. Um, and it was a very poetic and very beautiful experience where actually quite some professional makers from all over the world got very excited. Uh, so just to say, um, uh, there's a new uh, <laughs> a new generation coming. Uh, just to, to maybe conclude some of these thoughts and then hopefully we can have some Q&A and a nice uh, discussion. Um, but uh, when you design theatrical experiences using mixed reality technologies, really consider the fact that this technology itself is live. Not necessarily the pre-recorded versions, but the real-time 3D and also streaming video is live. And that is really important to use in the making as well, because it, it, it adheres and resonates with the fact that, we're, of course, we are in the performing arts, which is by definition a live medium. Another thing is, is that this really is something about shared collectively. So in theater, we come together and it's shared collectively. Now with online technologies, uh, we're not in our own VR bubbles anymore. We can really share these mixed reality spaces in a very embodied way. Um, and also what is really interesting about these technologies that they can be changed and manipulated in real time relatively cheaply. So if you have very big ideas about a huge stage design or a huge world even that you move through, relatively easy you can prototype these spaces already in a, in a mixed reality space uh, with everybody involved, with the whole team involved, and really from experience make smart decisions on its design before you actually make it physically, if that would be the purpose. And like I said, it's also co-located. So you can have several real spaces and several virtual spaces being connected in a live experience. And that for a design process is also very interesting. For example, the Prague Quadrennial project that I showcased in the beginning, I've done with uh, or I made with a team of uh, three other people living all over the world in different places. And we could actually meet also in virtual spaces or like with Gob Squad, even if Corona hit, you still have a space that you can share and continue your design in. Uh, however, it does need new skills and know-how. So everybody involved, I mean, theater and performance is of course by definition already multidisciplinary, but we tend to also get used to a particular way of working, also in a certain hierarchy maybe. Um, I really, really encourage everybody who wants to embark uh, in, in using these mixed reality te te technologies to also allow to learn how to work interdisciplinary, to also have not a theater technician and a game uh, technician just be technicians, but also realize that they're actually part of the design team. Make sure that everybody steps into the creative process as early as possible, because you need all the know-how to really change this field. 
And then these new technologies um, are actually also affording new ways of experiencing, and that implies also new ways of making. So the question is, are we going to make theater in VR? Are we going to make film in VR? Are we going to make games in VR? It doesn't really necessarily work that way. It might actually be that this is a new hyper medium that also asks for new ways of making. Um, for example, like we already showed with the dance performance, the audience in the smack middle of the experience. So how do you relate then to your audience? How do you deal actually with storytelling if your audience is not just sitting in a chair uh, in a controlled room, but can actually roam around or maybe even pick up things or make a noise? Um, also, uh, the audience uh, can experience a performance from multiple perspectives. I, I find this very interesting. It's also very in line with more post-dramatic views on, on theater and performance, whereby you could say uh, people could actually uh, have different engagements with the virtual and the physical space. So you can actually have audiences in a physical space experiencing another perspective to the same performance happening in many spaces at the same time. Um, I think dr from a dramaturgical perspective, this is actually really wonderful because you can create much more layers and layering to the uh, uh, performance that you, you're making. Um, whether audience will get all the perspectives or not, that's up to you. It might also be that later they meet in a social space and then can exchange that they had these different views. Uh, so also the conversation uh, continues there. Um, and this role of audience uh, is also changing, I think, by introducing this real-time media. Uh, that means that, that you go from spectator to participant to experiencer to maybe even performer. Um, so I'm not saying you have to, but these are things that at least you could consider while, while you introduce these kinds of instruments uh, and, and possibilities. Uh, so having said all that, a um, uh, final point is, of course, um, while we thought that VR would really be something about escaping your body, being in another space, I don't. Everybody who has done VR knows it's actually a very physical experience. So, when you're embarking with these technologies, uh, keep the, the physical body central and really play with this idea that you can really. Uh, engage the physical body in the experience and connect to physical spaces. So this spectatorship while you're sitting in a chair, that could be an option. However, I think the medium itself affords so many uh, ways of embodying engagement that it would be really interesting to explore a bit more. Uh, so thank you. Sorry for the, that the slides disappeared uh, in the beginning, uh, but I think we made it uh, nevertheless. And uh, if there's any questions, uh, I really look forward to your response as professionals. Thank you so Great. much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Joris, for a really interesting presentation. Now, I'm sure you all have many questions, and I, I suggest that you will raise your hand here and I will deal the questions. We take about 10 minutes for the questions and then we move on. So let's see where do we have the first. If you raise your hand here in the, in the by your um so far i don't see any just, hands but just does one, somebody um, one practical question if um there was a question in the chat if yaris we could have your slides or at least some links that it included and send those to the participants afterwards. yeah yeah let's let's uh, think about that anastina how we make this available and then of course i can also share of course all the sources um I've been, uh, uh, I would be most happy, of course, to to make sure that everybody can look at them later. Um, this was a bit Good. rushed, <laughs> I understand, but yeah. Great. <laughs> Ulrich Lenz had ha a hand up. Please. Yes, hello. This is Ulrich from Berlin, Commissio Opera. Uh, we uh, are focusing also on, on uh, virtual real reality and mixed reality and, and, and uh, trying to learn a lot about that. And for me, Always a problem is that with virtual reality and also mixed reality, you need those uh, glasses or this, this VR glasses. Um, and the problem is, or not problem, but comparing it with a, with a normal live performance, you can get only a few spectators, performers, whatever yep. they are in it. Do you see or have you worked on, on projects where more than, let's say, the 20, 50 uh, participants uh, could participate? like? A, a real audience hall of people, kind of 200 and 300, because 
if, if you present it to 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 your directors, it's always yeah, well, it's a fine thing, but it's for twenty people, and um, yeah. yeah, we have a to fill up an yes. opera house with one thousand two hundred people. Well, Ulrich, uh, I, yes, this is a very relevant question, um, and this is what I meant with multiple perspectives and also a multi-channel multi approach. You could imagine that some of the audience would actually be in VR, some of the audience would be in a physical space mm -hmm. looking at the physical performance. Other people might actually follow it through a, a YouTube stream or maybe on their browser that is a 3D engine that they can actually move around, but they're not necessarily inside it, just look at the screen. So what I noticed that most performing arts uh, institutions are now exploring, including the Royal Shakespeare Company was mentioning this, this as well, yes. is to offer multiple entryways to the same experience. And I think this is probably the best way to go because also if you have 500 people sitting in your undoubtedly beautiful opera building, it would be a bit strange having them all sit with the helmet on while you also have this beautiful space together. So it's it's not that I try to advocate that everybody should put a helmet on, it's rather these technologies open up multiple spaces and multiple perspectives, including still the physical being together in a space looking at the live performance. Um, so that would be a little bit my answer to that. Um, yeah. but, and sorry, but, so yeah, just sorry. to ask this Weltatem with a choir formed by performers with, with yeah. a VR uh, device, there were spectators in the room and they yes. didn't have any VR uh, yeah. device, they just watched had the performance. The, yes, we had, yeah, I was not too clear because of time, but we had 60 uh, audience members and 30 of them would get a VR helmet on and the 30 other audience members would look at their peers becoming sun suddenly performative mm -hmm. and then halfway the performance, their roles change. Uh -huh. So halfway they swap actually roles. Um, so yeah, we're, we're really playing with this idea of creating different perspectives. And then the second group that had the VR helmets on, we also actually deconstructed the whole stage. So when, because they already knew what would happen with the first group, but then we deconstruct the whole stage. So when they put their helmets on, they're off, they're suddenly in a different environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Great. Thanks. Very good question, very relevant for all Super of us. Super relevant. R yeah. Running houses. Uh, any other hands? I see no other hands. We can still take one question if you have. Are you, uh, Joris, are you participating in the end discussion or? Yeah, yeah, I will, yeah. I will uh, stick around so till five. So people come up with some yeah. other questions so we can take it. Anastina, uh, did you have a hand as, as well? Yes. Um, I want to ask um, on your thoughts on like volumetric capture on yeah. first of all like when do you think it's going to like have its breakthrough if it is going to have that soon and also what do you see as its like sort of pros or like benefits or if it's actually going to be something interesting to, to watch um, volumetric yeah. capture yeah. compared to 2D? Uh, well it's really about uh, the spatial relationship you have with you have with a performer. So in VR, if it's a flat plane, it works if you have a frontal stage perspective. But when you start moving around, they immediately become almost like cardboard, and that that is immediately also feeling that you're not in the same space per se because you're a volumetric person. So I think one of the benefits of having a stream, a volumetric video stream with the performer. Uh, in a virtual space that is actually spatially in relation to you, there's a lot of like parts of your sensory equipment that starts to respond to its presence. And I've, I've also experienced this. I've seen a dance performance with a volumetric capture where really parts of your body and sensory equipment starts to really immediately, of course, relate uh, to that other uh, body, even if it's like a hollow balloon <laughs> uh, mm. being there. And and interestingly, uh, there were moments where you could touch each other and uh, you, I, I was holding controllers. And when that uh, virtual uh, dancer would sort of touch your hand, the, it would vibrate. And it was very interesting that their, their bodies were partly etheric, uh, but they also partly were still volumetric. Uh, so you could really feel a different. It, it's a different. I'm not saying it's replacing presence or it's equal to presence, but it's a different kind of presence that that I find was very, very uh, interesting to explore more. Uh, however, 
the, the studios you need, the amount of equipment you need, the quality of the stream as of yet, of course, is still under development. Eh? So you don't want to have these huge uh, green screen studios uh, right now. Uh, but I it, like with all equipment, including uh, headsets, etc., and mocap, it's getting cheaper and cheaper. So this is just a matter of time. And meanwhile, of course, we can already start thinking about what it is we, we would like to do with it. Mm. Fantastic. Do you, th do you think Sorry. the only um, distribution medium for volumetric capture is basically virtual reality, or do you think there are other? Um, no, no. No, you could use it also mm. with with uh, like holographic stage uh, uh, projections. You could use it yeah, in, yeah. In, in, mm. in in installations. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, projection mapping is still very powerful. Uh, so so there's many ways to have have those volumetric things emerge. And like I said, you can also have it now. Our computers becoming so fast, you can actually have a 3D real time engine in your browser, meaning you can actually rotate uh, the performance. Uh, with your mouse or maybe by your, your keystrokes. So even people who sit at home behind their laptop can still have a sensation of being in relation to a space and, and, and three-dimensional performers. Mm. Brilliant. Uh, shall we move now to uh, next, uh, next uh, presentation? Uh, we can still continue with Joris in the, uh, after this presentation. But right now, uh, we are proudly presenting the Finnish National Opera and Ballet's uh, current key work in process projects that aim to bring digital workflows to next level. I give the word now to our Timo Tuovila, Hannu Järvensivu and Kalle Rasinkangas, who will present the XR stage project, please. Thank you, Lilly. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Timo Tuovila, and I'm working here at the Opera and Ballet as a production and, and technical director. Uh, uh, thank you, Joris, about your uh, session, and, uh, and gives a very good uh, uh, overview about the uh, new technology coming to the performing arts. And I was a very happy to hear that that your students are also uh, interested about uh, developing the the designing process of the of the of the performing arts um always when we are doing the changes we have to ask by ourselves that that uh, why uh, to change something so, for example, why to change the production process in the other, in, in our case, opera and ballet world, which have been like that last like 300 and 400 years. So, which I mean that, that uh, we will get the, the scale set model by 1 to 25 and, and uh, then we will build, build that and then we will see the uh, production ready on, on stage. I would say that uh, yes, we we do not have to change that process, but I would say that it's it's uh, it's not very wise not to use the existing new technology because we can get better in 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 many ways. Uh, one of the problem is that uh, when we are doing the designing uh, designing the traditional way uh we we will see the the uh visuality which means uh the sets on stage the performers on stage lights on stage video on stage only a few weeks before the premiere uh when we have uh, uh all the uh possible tools ready to use uh to have a, a, a look about the visuality much before end. And still we are playing with a one to 25 uh, dollhouse with this existing process. Uh, also, I have to ask that, that especially from, from the people who are working at the opera, that how many times we have 
haven't accepted the uh, uh, final model because of the artistical uh, reasons. I guess not many times. But how about if we could have a simulation of several options on the face when the even the artistical uh, changes are possible? And, and not to mention all the functional simulations like a side views or, or safety, which we can check in, in simulation mode. Uh, now, if you change the next slide. So uh, this is the, uh, I would say that more or less the similar uh, production process which, uh, which we have in, in in, uh, in our colleague opera houses. So uh, we, we will make a, a, a production decision uh, almost three years before the premiere. And then we will, then we will uh, meet the uh, creative team, meaning the state director or ballet director with the set designer, lighting designer, costume designer, video designer, and, 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 and nowadays, other designers with the sound and immersive technology, where we will have a, a founding meeting and where we agree that these are the resources and, and artistic director will give the guidelines for the creative team that what she or he will uh, uh, is accept, accepting for this, this production to be. And then one and a half year before premiere, like today, we had a, a, a meeting of this when the creative team bring the, the white card model made with the cardboards where we had the look for the first uh, sketches. And, and then we comment this, uh, these uh, uh, sketches and then they, they will go home and, and do the work and they will come one year before with the final model. And with the final model, we will start to do the uh, technical engineering drawings. And of course, we will do the 3D model for that. And we do the some uh, lighting simulation in, in, in Vusibuk and, and so on. That we, of course, do. But the, the time in this phase is, is, is gone uh, for the possibilities to, to make any changes uh, for the model. And the model, as we know, is the concept for the whole production, giving the guideline for the for the even for the lighting and so on. So what we are proposing is is that that uh, we change the, the the way of the work, and and it is not about the tool. Obviously, we are talking about the tool, but but what we are proposing is that that we are proposing that 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 in the schools where they are teaching set designers, lighting designers, video designers, we start to think not to build uh, 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 one to 25 uh, models anymore, but start to think that how about if we start to build together with the creative team and with the opera house, the model in a virtual space. And for example, in, in that case where we had today meeting, so uh, it was uh, only with a couple of days work with the hand driven sketches, we could show that the creative team that, that actually your first sketches uh, would uh, look like this in, 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 the, in, in our opera house. And the thing is that, that when we met these, these people, most of them uh, use first time the virtual classes on on their head. So that is also telling that that uh, uh, we are taking the first steps, and it is the new technology, and and it is quite many times also afraid that that how they work and so on. So that's what what we are trying to to raise to change the culture of of working because we, we see that there are so many uh, benefits to pick up. And, and, and the thing is that all those tools are existing and they are uh, very much developed on, on those times when, when Joris told about the early, early, early times in, in, in 
filmmaking. I mean, I mean nowadays it's it's totally different tools. But now I I, I give the word for uh, for our deputy head of of uh, set workshop. Uh, Hannu Järvensivu and, and Kalle Rasinkangas. Kalle Rasinkangas is helping us in our project and, and is, is one of those uh, genius guys uh, with uh, expert with this uh, virtual reality, but also uh, 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 graduated as a sound designer in, in lighting and sound department in, in Theatre Academy of Finland. Okay, now Hannu and, and Kalle, please, Thank or is yours. Thank you, Timo. Can you all guys read me? Yes. Okay, cool. So I am Hannu Järvensivu. As Timo mentioned, um, assisting head of the set department and uh, spending half of my time with our XR stage project head for the next one and a half years, almost two years. And uh, when I started this, uh, took about uh, took the uh, task in or proposed demo that I can take the task task in the basically the starting point was so delicious we were having the already the proof of concept of the virtual stage environment done we knew that it was working technically Hannu turn on your camera please it would be nice okay. to see you when you talk so Thank hold you. on for I just have to stop my presentation for a second to turn my camera and okay and then reshare just a second now i have somebody coming in here just okay can you guys see him now so the situation starting situation was quite quite delicious in that respect that we were having a proof of concept done we were already having the immersive interface uh, where, where the spectator was able to move around of the functional functional stage and the house environment with the virtual classes and uh, also through the uh, Unreal Engine game development environment where the actual set was done. And uh, furthermore, uh, the also the time was pretty much right. <laughs> was pretty right because we were doing marvelous sets for the for the operas and we were already doing them in a on a digital way so we were using CAD tools for the for the designing them we were using uh, CNC tools for manufacturing things and uh, basically we were playing around with the physical 1 to 25 or one even 150 scale models digitizing them measuring them uh, putting things up on the on the digital part and playing this game and spending plenty of time with it. On the other hand, at the same time, uh, the resourcing has been all the time tighter and uh, the environment has been all the time. Even despite, uh, without Corona, it would, be, would have been all the time the, the we would have been forced to do more precise design, both on artistic and technical level in order to be able to manufacture things on an efficient manner. And of course, as we want to maximize the stage use, 
the stage is very booked. So whenever we are able to find the ways to actually release the stage time from technical design or from technical days to to productive use, it is also always helping the helping the house in actually gaining more performances. What we did in the phase one, we had already done uh, the full uh, 3D scanning of the stage and the house. The model was imported to the game development environment, to the Unreal environment. It was processed uh, and there the, uh, the, the functional elements were actually implemented so that the lift, lift pipes, floor hoists, curtains, masks, uh, light rigging, etc. were separated from the, from the point cloud and taken as a functional element so that we were able to operate it. After that, the system was ready for local use with the PC, uh, VR glasses or PC. And uh, we were we already started to share share the materials on the on the virtual st stage through the Zoom or Teams meetings. And the first first uh, lighting lighting designs were done in this manner. Now the second phase started in last August and uh, our goal is to, of course, to enhance the tool technically and to create a genuine capabilities for remote work so that the artistic teams can actually work with the with the even ske set sketches there either independently or assisted by our operation. And uh, we are also aiming to integrate the uh, the lighting control system so that the the preliminary lights programming could do could be done remotely so that the it the, the actually the work would be at least 80% done before the actual set and the actual stage would be needed for finalizing them this work will probably take the next one and a half years so that the uh, we would be able to actually use it fully as a as a genuine remote tool for the set designers and the and the directors and then the actually entire artistic team. Even today we were getting a couple of questions when we were promoting this or showing the uh, the environment to an opera house of the that would it be possible to get the costumes also in? Yes, it is. So basically we are still in a pretty much also investigation mode that what everything can be done here, even in a production side. In daily use, what we do, lighting design is, is sort of a forerunner. There we are the, uh, in most advanced situation with the uh, with the use of the technology. So what we have done mainly is that we import the CAD designed uh, set elements into the uh, VR stage. Uh, we are defining, for example, the mask locations there. We are actually programming uh, the lighting patterns, we are checking for the leaks in the mask and so forth. Uh, also, as we are repertoire house, we are having uh, several uh, presentations on the stage simultaneously. So what we are doing is that we are figuring out that how to uh, change the set uh, on a, from daily rehearsal to performance in the night or between the rehearsals or between the performances. And now what we started to pilot today is to actually work with the set sketches, create a, uh, so simple models and actually show them to the artistic team so that they can discuss about that mutually and they can actually figure out that, OK, that are their ideas aligned well? Because quite often the artistic teams are scattered around they don't necessarily work together or even see or discuss before they are actually coming into in a traditional model and they are coming into Opera House and present the, uh, the artistic design for the first time. So the benefits we can gain here. First of all, if we get the artistic teams to discuss more thoroughly already in the early phase, we get less uncertainties in the technical design and we are able to figure out the technical solution and manufacturing much faster. On the other hand, when the artistic teams are able to work on a remote basis, they don't they are actually working more efficiently. They don't have to travel around that much. 
they don't have to actually check up things so often as they do in the traditional model. Also, the lighting designer and projections, when the set is available in a virtual environment, there's more time to make the early designs or preliminary designs before the before the, uh, the stage time. And of course, as Timo mentioned, when we are able to work in the uh, in with the virtual set, we are actually having even six months more time to make the make the technical engineering and make the manufacturing of the set. So in that respect, we are buying some time for also for ourselves. One of the probably less visible uh, visible benefit that is on, on work planning perspective quite in, interesting or quite important is that the, the more certain we are about the set content in the early phase, uh, the less need there are to do any changes during the manufacturing or during the rehearsal period, which is very tight in time wise. So basically, whenever something like that happens, our workshops are getting mixed up for several days or even week or two. So basically, this is also internal tool to help us for our internal. Nothing comes for free. So typically this kind of project requires subcontracting contractor for actually doing the 3D modeling of the house and of the stage. Then, OK, probably and most most likely there is also a subcontracting project needed for actually putting it into the development environment. And of course, integrations with the existing control systems are something that are are requiring resources typically external resources because there's pretty pretty much in uh, coding and interface use requested for those ones. Of course, the uh, depending on the level of ambition here, uh, actually the cost can go even very high or they can be quite moderate. Of course, the ICT infrastructure will be needed. So in house there's need for having a decent workstations. Of course, piece, of course pieces of software will be needed. Then when the, the uh, environment is shared to the external parties, some kind of a server solution or cloud solution is needed for hosting and uh, and being able to control the login and so forth. And then, of course, there's a need for, as already mentioned several times, there's a need for enough knowledge to be able to develop and and operate and maintain the assets that are are actually gained through the project. So this, in, during this second phase, we really do the technical improvements. We improve the remote access for to the tool. Also, what is visible that we in, improve our internal processes for manufacturing and designing the sets so that we are uh, taking the, the 3D modeling into, as the, into, into the process or enhance the conversation with with the artistic teams and so forth. We co-work with the with the universities to actually improve the or invoke the education of the of the set designers so that the, the tools are taken into the into the programs. Or at least we promote this very hard and then go with the cooperation with the external stakeholders, some subcontractors or some op uh, other opera houses so that we are able to do the pilot production both in house and also with the with the other other our external partners and of course finally as a part of our internal process we put the, everything on on paper and uh, and put it to the cabinet or safe safe cabinet then once everything is ready so this was my part so now i'm going to hand over to kalle and uh, let kalle to actually show the demo how, how the damn thing works today. So Kalle, the stage is yours, kindly take over. Thank you. Thank you, Hanno. I would like to add uh, one point that this project is, is open for everybody. So if you are interested to join, please contact Hanno and, and, uh, and uh, we will start to do uh, all together. So our one of the target is that, that 
that uh, would be great if if we could find together the the common way to to work in future. Okay, so can you see my screen now? Put thumbs up if you can. Yes. Okay. We can. Thank you. Uh, so this is the version that is that is usable on your web browser. Uh, now it's running on my own computer, but it is also working on Amazon servers. So I'm only using my computer, so you don't you can see the IP address, so you can go there and do something that I don't want to do at this presentation. Okay. Uh, so what we have here uh, is the web page where you can go. So it's a normal web web page which works which works on any one of your devices on your computer, your mobile phone, your iPad or whatever pad you have. And uh, it's fully operational and fully interactive. So if I just click in there and then I can start moving around like I was playing a video game. I don't know if it's, uh, let me know if it's too laggy or if, if it's dropping frames or anything like that. But as you can see, we have the whole uh, big stage of the Helsinki Opera House in here. And it's pretty pretty realistic. Like if you go close to a chair, you can see that. Well, if you if you would like 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 to find your own chair, let's say you're sitting in the row seven and you want to find okay, so row seven is uh, around here, and then your seat is maybe 308. So you can just go there, and that's how it looks from that that point of view. Uh, so yeah, that's all nice and fine. Uh, it's looking really really impressive. I didn't do the 3D modeling, so don't thank me for that. Uh, what I did was more the uh, interactive part of this. So how this works as a tool now, uh, like I said, anyone can go there, anyone can uh, join in there and, and move around in there. But also, in addition to that, you can uh, change things in there in real time. For example, if I click set designs, well, now we only have uh, the empty stage and Don Giovanni, because other ones that we ha have are a little bit classified at the moment, probably. So if I click on Don Giovanni, it'll take just a small while, and then we'll have Don Giovanni on the stage, and then we can move around and see what is happening on the on the set of Don Giovanni. And if there would be more uh, stage pictures on the on the opera. I don't know if there were more on on Don Giovanni, but if there were like 15 different scenes or 15 different sets on on an opera, you just change them here on runtime, and it would be all working working in real time. And uh, yeah, you can probably see I'm not a UI designer, so don't mind about those those uh, web 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 page designs. It's not my field, uh, but what what can you do more with this now? So you can have the stage on there, but uh, if you would have this as a tool for, especially for an artistic uh, group, there would be probably director, set designer, choreographer, lighting designer, maybe maybe even costume designer. Uh, what what you could do with this tool is that you could be here. Uh, all of you could use it at the same time, so there could be five people using it at the same time, 10 people using it at the same time. I don't know what, what the scale is, maybe even 200 people using it at the same time. Uh, but uh, we made this tool in here uh, called Marker, which is pretty self-explanatory. So you can just uh, change your marker size and color. And when I go to draw mode, you can do sort of uh, sketches or uh, notes on the stage. So for example, if the director wants to tell that the uh, performer who is who is uh, standing there should walk down the stairs and go to the right. And people always have this sort of uh, weird thing with right and left. They are always confusing them together, especially when you're looking at from this perspective. Is it right from the view of the camera or right from the view of the performer? So rather than just having that discussion, they could just draw on the ground and say, OK, just move there and uh, let's change the color. And uh, then the performer performs here. And then the other performer comes from behind and stops there and uh, maybe just a little bit of dance around here. And then we can just move around and we can look. Yeah, this looks pretty good. And uh, 
you can also go to the audience see if if you go really high up on the third balcony can you see those movements yes you can that's pretty good choreography even though i'm not a professional choreographer myself uh, maybe maybe someone is not happy the set designer is not happy okay there should be there should be this uh, large box over here so they can't move here let's raise it and uh, let's say that this performer goes here instead so now it's all nice and they're not blocking anything uh, also you can have this um, let's just clear all of those uh, you can also measure things so for example if you can't really remember okay so how how wide was the staircase you can just use this measure tool and uh, let's see about 1.4 meters so if you have a set piece or costume that they are bringing down the stairs you know if it will fit the stairs or not or if you want to bring something from the side uh, you can also just do a little bit of measurement and that's 2.65 meters so anything that is less than that will fit from there uh, so that's basically most of it just as a proof that this is not it's running on my computer but it's going through the through the uh, server so you can see on my camera if you can see my camera oh I just get a message that's <laughs> that was really unfortunate so I can just move it, move it around with my phone and also if I enable the mobile keys I can also use them really nice UI design I know uh, Actually, it was Anastina sending me a message about the light scenarios. So uh, that's something that is still under under work, but I can quickly show what, what you can do. For example, we could just do a blackout and have the, ha have the scene there with the lights and uh, how it looks. Uh, something that is coming in the future that sort of works now, I can really quickly show it just as an example you could go to one of these uh, lights and just click it now i have to do a little bit of dancing around screens i could turn it on change the intensity if i want to let's make it nice and red a little bit of green and blue in there and then uh, have this this lovely gobo and have it rotate a little bit And uh, yeah, so now you can see that we have that light in there and it's rotating and it's all real time. Uh, I think that's mostly what is going on with this, this uh, thing now. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'm more than happy to answer any questions or ideas or, or improvement ideas or, or, I don't know, fears about this technology. Great. Uh, are you saying that this is the end of your presentation, Kalle? Uh, basically, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm, I op I'm open to questions, so yeah. I hope there will be questions. So let's have questions and answers. Uh, again, the same system as before, so please put your hand up and I'll give the turns here. Any, any hands coming up? It's an absolutely fantastic fantastic tool, uh, both for te technical departments, but also for artistic uh, departments. I think this will really make a dramatic change, um, change in the future. Anyone? Anna Stina, go for it. Yes, um, so you were here drawing in 2D or on, on the stage on the floor. But could you also, if you want to like sort of plan the sets in real time with your colleagues, could you uh, draw in 3D or bring in like ready-made 3D objects for the stage? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. That is something that is not working yet, but is coming in the future. Uh, I don't think, well, maybe in the future you could have sort of 3D drawing, but that's really hard with the 2D surface if you're using your phone or, or your uh, 
mouse, mouse or something, but in virtual reality, you could definitely have a 3D drawing. But uh, something that we were discussing earlier and something that is definitely going, going to be in there is that you can sort of have a predefined assets like a, just like regular cu cubes and stuff, and you can scale them around and move them around as a placeholder. And also maybe some sets that are 3D scanned, like you have these, uh, these chairs in here. Maybe you could have a menu where you can pop up one of those chairs and you can move it around and, and just tell it where it goes. So yeah, that's definitely something that is happening, having 3D assets also interactive in there. So really uh, kind of more dollhouse play that you can do in the future, that you can place things and people and move them around and search for the right constellation. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, good thing that you mentioned people because that's something that could al also be really, really useful to have this. We, we have now this scale model in here, but if we could move her around and have mm. like 10 different performers, put them on the stage as, as they would be in a choreography and see how it looks or maybe move them around or maybe, exactly. maybe yeah, change the size of the set and Good. see how it looks with them. Meliha, you have hand. First Meliha and then Michael, please. Thank you. First, I would like to say congratulations. This is so very impressive and we want the same tool. Uh, Which then, house are you from? Uh, sorry, the Norwegian National Opera and Ballet. Oh. Good. Uh, Go ahead. I was just wondering if is it possible when you draw on the stage floor the movements and other stuff, is there a way to save that in a 2D drawing? Uh, that's that's an excellent question. That's actually something that I had in mind earlier, but I forgot until this moment. So that is something that I was thinking that thinking that we definitely should have because it's yeah. you know it's pretty 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 bad if you have three hour meeting and you make this whole design of the stage and then it all disappears. So definitely there should be a button here that says save on disk and then you would have yeah. you would have it as a JPEG or something or Call even it. in a three D environment. Yeah. Call it to actually add something i think that that the uh, in minimum the screen a uh, screen capture would do the trick so control print screen would be the first asset but anyhow that's a good point to actually to include in the tool so that we could get to get the snapshots out the out of the display i, I would add, add one thing is that that the thing is that uh, nowadays everything is possible and and that's also the one risk that, that what uh, what is the most important to, to, to use to, to this tool so that, that we choose the most relevant things. And also keep in mind that, that, uh, that it should be uh, as easy use as possible, because as we know in, in our business, uh, there are more people who are not uh, sort of uh, IT uh, expert than, than the other ones. Uh, I just want to add as well, uh, we warmly welcome the Norwegian National Opera to uh, develop this uh, wonderful tool together. So uh, spread the evangelium to, the, to your colleagues there and Thank let's see what we can yeah. achieve together. Now I at give, the, uh, sorry, did Hannu yeah, want to? And we are at your service, ma'am, so please contact me. Yes. Michael, please present uh, which organization do you present and then have your question. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, from the Gothenburg Opera. Um, you hear me, right? Yes. Yes. We, we don't have your I... picture, but. Yes, uh -huh. we have. You don't? Oh, oh. Yes, we have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yes, we do. It's Sorry. Right. You're, not, you're not missing much. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, you talked earlier about uh, that you had to uh, 3D model the space itself. Um, I'm curious about uh, how. Oh, now they're now now they're making noise on stage. I'm curious how easy it is to pull in 3D assets uh, on the fly from from CAD programs and vector works and things like that. Um, or is the process more involved? Uh, that's that's an excellent question. I think well, well, Hanno, do you want to say something or? Yeah, um, basically, let's separate two things. The it is very easy and smooth to actually import the data from the public libraries into the 
into the uh, 3D space. But uh, when we talk about the the CAD programming, uh, typically the 3D CAD programming, or oh, sorry, the designs are they are not contained in the surfaces, and they are pretty complex models uh, from the presentation perspective. So there's a need for making an intermediate step to smoothen them and to render the surfaces on them. So as of today, there's still need for additional step before the CAD model is actually taken in or can be taken into the uh, into the uh, uh, XR tool. But anyhow, it is doable. Yeah, and that's actually something that we were just discovering and uh, discussing with Petri Sarkila, who is mm -hmm. a lighting operator at the Opera and who's one of the people who, who have pushed this project forward. And uh, we found one way that will make it a lot easier. And it's it's developing all the time, and more and more CAD tools are starting to have this um, live link feature. So you could do um, things in, in your CAD program, and you could have them on the game engine in, in real time, like the changes you make, make in the CAD program. But that is definitely develop, developing. And in three years, it will be a totally different landscape yeah. at, at the moment. It is continuous story of discovery here now that uh, basically we are having plenty of file formats and uh, uh, the compatibility is not always there, so everything needs to be discovered. But at its best, it's, it's quite smooth. At I its worst, it's very slow. <laughs> Sorry, Please. I have to say as artistic director, for example, today we had uh, a, a kind of a preliminary uh, presentation for a future project that is a co-production between uh, several houses. So we could uh, we could uh, change the houses um, uh, in the future to see how uh, the set looks in two different houses that might have a little bit different kind of uh, auditorium and and wider or higher, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's really gives an excellent opportunity to evaluate the functionality and visibility of the set design uh, at a very early stage. So, and because the co-production, um, uh, the way to do co-productions, it's get becoming more and more common and uh, and both uh, or all co-producers want to, want to have a 100% uh, good production. So, um, in that way, also this uh, this tool gives us an excellent opportunity to evaluate things early enough, so we can make it satisfactory in uh, all different houses. Yeah, just to add there that in this in the presentation we had today, we discovered that uh, basically that the uh, this set, okay, that was it was developed once, it was dropped into the different environments or different stages. On our house, it wasn't actually working properly on the, on the third balcony at all. But the, on the on the companies or the other companies, actually, it was pretty smooth. Also on those, also on the higher higher balconies. So basically, we discovered immediately a factor that that was actually Needs quite to be evident show yes evident showstopper as 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 of such. And that would be very difficult to track in a in a 1 to 25 model. I mean, it does take a lot of imagination. I've done this for nine years and evaluated many, many uh, models, and it's very difficult to put your imagination there to see how it would look, might look on the third balcony or here or there. But now here we have like a totally uh, out of, I mean, unquestionably uh, important information. So it's it's tremendous change and makes the decision making also much easier. Do I see any more hands, any more comments for this particular particular presentation? If not, then uh, let's continue our meeting and move uh, to the open conversation. So feel free to jump in and also present your own projects or share your thoughts related to these topics or any themes touched in today's presentation. We've, we've uh, reserved the last half an hour for, um, for this kind of open conversation because we want this to be interactive and we are curious to hear what you are. Uh, doing at the moment. Anastina has a hand up now, so maybe she has an exciting project happening. Please, Anastina. 
Um, I would like to ask, um, because um, we heard two excellent presentations, and I would also like to ask Joris if um, like some sort of like new ideas came to your mind on sort of like fusing or bringing together um, some of the, the examples you had from performing arts, um, mm. like pieces that have already been made in VR and in MR. And if you could somehow imagine like new applications of those technologies, like applied to this XR stage design, for example, by um, letting or um, bringing the performers to, to re rehearse, for example, on this kind of stage or, or any other ideas that came to your mind during this presentation? Well, apparently you can read my mind because that's indeed exactly what I was thinking about, that if you have a live stage, which in fact you have now, um, having not only the design team, but also the performers and the director and the dramaturg uh, involved in using those virtual stages in an earlier uh, stage of, 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 of production, uh, hopefully also you get new new insights on, on what could be done more even. Uh, I think the, the presentation was very clearly showing the normal process of production, uh, especially if it's a big production, expensive production, that a lot of certain design decisions you have to fixate just for the logistic purposes. Um, and, and I think it's so nice that you're creating now a real-time environment that is almost like a thinking or sketching environment that is actually embodied it is actually spatial uh, so that means you can have indeed performers in you can try out certain scenes you can indeed have uh, thoughts about how audiences maybe can have different perspectives uh, or indeed uh, like Lydia was saying it, if you're doing a performance in, in in many different locations maybe you need to adjust the performance itself and not only the stage design and light design um, I would really I'm very happy to hear that you're already working on connecting light systems uh, to this engine because through MIDI or OSC or DMX, these are all protocols that are all digital. So it means uh, your, your, your stage lighting tables can actually communicate with these engines as well, which is of course fantastic, which means you can live puppeteer all sorts of uh, 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 environments and sets and, and lighting uh, while trying things out. So I, I really uh, hope, but you're already on this track obviously, but I know from my low cost experimenting that getting people in in a very early stage and really devising and trying out in such an early stage delivers so much worth worthy insights and can also really help you to innovate and to explore things without immediately extreme cost or, or big uh, risks. Uh, so I think it, it's really wonderful that that you uh, you're doing this. Uh, so yeah, th these are thoughts that go through my mind uh, as well. Yeah. I just want to add here, for example, the, the situation where different houses might have slightly different size choruses and maybe the director needs to relocate the groups slightly differently. You know, you might uh, do with 60 chorus in one house and only 50 chorus in another house. Or also I want to play with idea of uh, that the artists can really acquaint themselves with the set, um, how to move around safely. This has also to do with work safety. And we, we will um, most probably save a lot of time when people could be familiar with the physical set in VR before we start rehearsing. So it is a wonderful cornucopia of opportunities, this XR tool. Yeah, and if I may add, that's a very good point. I did a lot of projections in, in performances and often the design team and the director and the you know, scenographer, whatever, uh, is sitting actually in the perspective of the, of the spectator, of the audience. But the performers are often on stage. And I remember one of the performer being a bit not, not so well physically, and she came through our side, so to speak, or our perspective. And I heard her literally say, oh, 
that's what we're doing. And I'm like, okay, it's interesting that we often forget that if you have stage designs with a lot of projection and lights and all sorts yeah, of stuff, exactly. often performers cannot see what, where that, how it looks, <laughs> you know, what, what exactly. they relate relate to. And and these these technologies really help that as well. You can actually have multiple perspectives even uh, uh, at the same time, seeing how it how it works while you're moving around or while you're performing. So uh, mm. I think that is very interesting as well for performers so to speak yeah. absolutely any observations anyone do you want to share with a project that might be of interest to this audience today uh, I see a hand and uh, yes uh, Ludek Golat please and uh, open your microphone open your microphone we hear you better My name Hello. is Golat Ludek. Hello, uh, I'm from Czech Republic. Uh, Opava, this is a small theater uh, near from Poland and Slovak. Uh, this is uh, a theater uh, like under Wien. This is a copy from the theater in past time. The was the uh, first performance of, of Magic Flutes. Uh, and uh, we now start project, his name is Virtual Stage, together with this uh, French, uh, uh, Holland and Italian uh, partner. And uh, it is Erasmus project. Uh, it's a little bit different, but naturally this is about uh, COVID, about, uh, about uh, uh, music, uh, uh, do it music together uh, to be alone and also study music together to be uh, in distance. Uh, and uh, so uh, we will also do some virtual stage scenography and uh, will be in, uh, um, uh, three opera Monteverdi uh, trilogy from Monteverdi uh, and uh, that will be on the end in Opava Theater uh, 23 and uh, I uh, all time uh, need to have some partners they is so so uh, made so long way before us uh, to do something in this in this things uh, you know, my, my professor for design was Svoboda. Uh, I know very well all technologies about uh, about uh, all this thing film together with theater and so on. But it was so complicated and so uh, much money uh, you needed and so long time to do film, to prepare all the things and after to, to put together. But uh, that this is now you, you you I don't know how long time you be doing all the things uh, but uh, I hope long time uh, but it will be perfect if we can uh, have some connection or do something together or some uh, you can uh, get me uh, help with with this project please um, if I can, I send you uh, our project, I'll send you and ask the things and uh, we can have contact, it will be fantastic for me. Well, that's the whole point of this uh, community, is about sharing and uh, finding common interests. So I'm very happy, Golat, that you are have joined us here at the Opera Beyond and uh, let's uh, stay tuned. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else uh, who still want to take uh, take the stage and comment? Do you still have questions for Joris or for our XR Tool team or some other uh, questions? Oscar, please. You wrote it in the mail, but you are or in the chat, but you are welcome to just uh, give the question also. Do you want to? I think we can we can send okay, we can. the link or Carla can share it maybe here also the, the link for the website. Ah, okay. Yeah, should I share it now or 
because then there will be like 50 people using it at the same time. But I don't know if that's a problem. It might be a fun experiment for for yeah, all of you. I was thinking that uh, it would be actually quite nice stress test for the for the yeah, environment yeah. to see that yeah. it's a simultaneous ahead. user. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I'll just quickly yeah. uh, start the start the server because now it was only running on my computer. But it'll take like a minute or two for it to start. Uh, I still would like to um, ask everyone, uh, Joris and even even the FNOB team, um, do you think we could like do whole performances in this kind of set? Can we just build a completely virtual set and have a production on that? That would never become physical at all, or, but but to have um, on on our virtual stage. Well, like I said in my presentation, that this is these experiments are really uh, happening already for a few years now. Uh, also, uh, rooting or dating back to things that already happened in Second Life, and and there's a lot of interesting knowledge that has been built up by those communities uh, that you could definitely make use of. Um, I don't know, but this is maybe something for for the technical team. Uh, how multi-user and how uh, yeah, in terms of how many users can be be there in real time, and whether it's then online uh, feasible to have full on avatars, etc. But mm. within the domain of social VR. Uh, mm. There are many platforms being produced right now online where you can do these things. Like there's full performances now happening in VR chat, for example. But uh, what but about synchronized music? I mean, when we we yes. need to be kind of yeah. very precise yeah. in the audio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 actually, uh, I think I'm not sure if it's Tampere University or yeah, I think so. But also Alto. I, th I think there was a, a very interesting uh, performance uh, uh, experiment in uh, doing uh, with Iceland, the Baltic states, and Finland, uh, like a live performance on different places. And then you need specialized networks for that, though. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, but yes, it's possible. But latency, I understand it. It's our biggest enemy. But um, uh, yeah, for for yes. sure, uh, that is something that you can. Uh, for the infrastructure of the performers, you can have a higher bandwidth infrastructure than, of course, uh, the audiences, because the audiences can be slightly later. They will not really notice that. So, OK, thanks. Timo. Uh, well, I'm not sure whether, whether I should say this, because knowing Lily, when, when, when giving, giving something, <laughs> we, are, we are doing that tomorrow. So <laughs> the thing is that, that uh, we have all Shall those. <laughs> we have all those gadgets already in the house because it's it's you know uh, green screens and and uh, virtual classy classes and cameras and all that stuff. So immediately tomorrow we can do easily the virtual reality show or mixed reality show by by having the the performers and, and mix the, the the audience. So so. We have all those tools. I mean, it's just uh, imagination how we are using that. Yeah, I think Hannu here, just to add that, I think that the the real problem really comes in the broadcast. So in this, mm. in the network side, so the both high quality, real time uh, visual material plus high quality audio material, they are quite a heavy package to deliver over the net. So. That is probably the biggest, biggest technical issue we have there. Creating the the presentation is on stage locally is not an issue as such. Now you have the the link on the chat box um, for the. Kakalle, kindly follow um, up the for the model. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, if if there are, let's see, are there any more questions or? Uh, no more hands. So then let's um, let's uh, okay. There's one more chat in Alto Tampere University and University of the Arts Helsinki. Yes, the Magix Consortium. That's a very good one as well, indeed. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, okay. Jokke uh, Hekkila had a question. There's one more hand. Yeah. No, no. I was just uh, hi, Jokke Hekkila from from um, Theater Academy. <laughs> Just a quick note to the magic. Hi, Joris. Hey, <laughs> quick okay. Note uh, about the magic concern to uh, actually Alto and and Tampere University and, um, and the University of the Arts and their theater academy. We have just 
putting as of today I've been configuring <laughs> this uh, uh, low latency, this high network. So we are getting the capability to do a stream and, and move data, video and audio with a very, very low latency between the, the different universities. And I, I said here before, it is a, it's a technology which is not easily available, but at least it would allow the performance part to, to happen. And then that could be streamed, you know, where, where the, the, the people at the, the performers are scattered around and that could be streamed to the audience, which as uh, Jory said, it, it's a, Jory said, it's not, a, it doesn't matter if there's some latency, but anyways, there is technology, there's new discoveries for us and, and our peers lot to be made. But yeah, we're looking into this and dwelling into this realm of, of real-time collaborative work. Uh, Super exciting. Thank you very much, Jokke. Tapio has a hand up as well. Please, Tapio. Hello, Tapio Lamaki from Akukan. Um, there are several music academies at the moment doing uh, teaching of the students on COVID times with very low latency and not so high bandwidth. So I'm sure the technology is there. It's just us up to uh, get that to serve us, that's mm. all. Thanks. That's true, but with with uh, uh, what interests me especially is the um, the multi art form, uh, huge constellations. When it's it's not one to one teaching, but then when you have all these heavy various aspects in it. But of course, uh, it can be scaled, and hopefully the large scale can uh, materialize as soon as possible as well. Uh, who's next? Mikael, Michael Menel. Mikael Menel. Hi, just I wanted to mention on the, on the, oh, of course, as soon as I open my mouth, they make noise on stage. It's crazy. Um, so I don't know if you're hearing this, but um, they're doing sound tests. Uh, as far as music is concerned, uh, uh, if, if, if you don't feel limited to only classical, performing classical, uh, works for instance synchronized um f you know with multiple users around the world yeah. uh, i'm involved i'm involved with a group a program called endless fm which is loop based music it's a lot of electronica for instance but i mean i i as a musician um just plug in my you know guitar and i sing and i you know plug in my home studio in, in that sense and um the latency because of the way the program it's it's a it's an iphone app it's a desktop app now it's coming to windows it um it, it makes the experience of creating music live with other people um, um, fl very fluid. There's, you don't notice the latency because of your perspective. You're always getting the most updated version of the stream, basically. And we've been hundreds of people in those streams at a time making music together, although it is that that you're limited to, to making loops and loop-based music. But it could be interesting to combine with the, the XR uh, experience as an experiment uh, uh, to see how it could, uh, the two can, could work together, I think. So I, I posted a link in the, in the chat there for Endless FM. Great. Uh, with three S's. So just, just check it out. I think, I mean, uh, uh, um, I'm clo uh, I've been a beta tester since it started. So it would be an interesting project to, to work together with Tim Exile, the, the, the guy that started it. Um, and we're a very strong community of people. Um, uh, people that come from sec, you know, the whole Second Life scene as well. That 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 are looking for, we're looking for a social way to make music. And there was even a school that when they, when they got locked down in America, that used Endless to um, to basically for their students to complete their 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 final work together as a group. So it's interesting. Fantastic. Um, I think it's time to close up now. I, I really want to thank everyone. We were over 50 people here for most of the time. Thank you for joining us today at the session. This, uh, as you saw, it was recorded and the, the recording of our webinar will be uploaded online afterwards. So you can also share it with the colleagues if you feel like it. The next webinar will take place in the beginning of December when we will uh, be covering audio related topics, immersive sound and the interesting applications of spatial sound in our field. So um, stay tuned and uh, follow us on the operabeyond.com 
website and uh, our social media channels and see you then in December. Many thanks for everyone who contributed to this important session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also quickly bye. just want to add that this was, this was a really good test because I already found, found one bug in the in the <laughs> not not on the program but on the server. So I need to change some settings on the server so we can have more than I think eight people at the same time. So, Brilliant. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay Thank you thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye.